Hi, I thought it might be interesting to do a video on an engineering challenge that I encountered while working on an FPGA-based VR4300 CPU. To start off with, let's look at the problem. By default, computers typically interpret strings of ones and zeros as integer values, either encoded in signed two's complement or unsigned format. If we consider modern computers, these integers are often the width of the computer's data path, being at the 32 or 64 bits wide. Unfortunately, however, integers are unable to represent fractional numbers, which are quite useful in many calculations. To solve this, enter the IEEE 754 floating point standard. This standard defines a 32-bit single precision encoding and a 64-bit double precision encoding. Here, numbers are effectively stored in scientific notation using base 2 instead of the typical base 10. Here we can see that each encoding is broken down into a sine bit, an exponent part, and a fractional or mantissa part. The representation is given by a sine multiplied by a fractional part with a tacked on 1 multiplied by 2 to an exponent minus a bias. I am not going to go into any more specifics since I have or will cover them in another video. The important point is that they use an exponential notation and the fractional part is in binary. Let's consider the case of addition in base 10 scientific notation. How would you add 2.1 times 10 to the 4th and 9.8 times 10 to the 5th? First we want to denormalize the numbers so that they have the same exponent. In this case we can use the larger exponent. Now we add 0.21 and 9.8 and carry the exponent down. But we have a problem. We need to renormalize the result so that it is once again in scientific notation, where it becomes 1.001 times 10 to the 6th. To do that, we need to first realize that we had a digit in the tens place of our answer. Let's look at a similar problem in single precision. Recall that the fractional part of a single precision number is 23 bits wide, which is what we have after the decimal point here. Now, we need to denormalize them so that they have the same exponent. This is done by shifting the smaller number to the right. And then we can add the 2 just like before. Now notice that we have a bit in the 2's place, and therefore we need to shift the number to the right and increment the exponent to bring it back into a normalized number. To do this, however, we need to first recognize that we have gone over into the 2's place. That's easy for a human to do, but it's non-trivial for a computer. The first thing we can take note of is that the pre-normalized result occupies 25 bits in total. Additionally, recall that this is being done with a fixed width data path in a computer. So let's say it's a 32-bit computer. This means that we need to have some value, either 0 or 1, in the other 7 bits. The only sensible value is 0. So let's tack on some zeros to pad out these numbers. Notice how in the normalized case we have 8 zeros before the 1, but in the result after the addition we only have 7. So if we could somehow count the number of zeros in front of the 1, we could then realize that we need to shift the addition result and increment the exponent. This was a fairly trivial example. However, there are other floating point examples which are not as trivial, where the result could be off by many more digits. For example, consider subtracting two numbers that only differ in the last bit. In this case, we would need to shift the result by 23 bits to renormalize it. A quick note about floating point hardware. Here is a block diagram from the VR4300 datasheet showing the exponent data path. There are three things to take note of. We have an adder, we have a storage register and a feedback path, and we have a leading zero count. By the way this hardware is set up, we need to be able to perform a modification to the exponent by the leading zero count in a single cycle. That means that the value from the leading zero counter is not actually the leading zero count, but is an offset from the expected one's position. Consider the case where two fractional numbers that only differ in the last digit are subtracted, which results in a leading zero count of 31. However, we only need to modify the exponent by the offset of zeros, which in this case is 23. This means that we need to modify the result of the leading zero count before we send it to the adder in the exponent data path. Alternatively, we could do the correction in another cycle using the exponent data path itself, but that would take more time to execute a single instruction, which is not what we want. Notice how the result is transformed by taking the expected number of zeros and subtracting the leading zero count from it. So this means that in addition to counting the leading zeros, we also need to place the transformation to LZ in into this component. Keep that in mind when we look at a few implementation examples. The first thing that we can try to do is to write a hardware description of a leading zero counter, where we specify every possible result and respond with the expected count. 
Here I did exactly that for a 64-bit number in VHDL. The screenshot only shows the first 22 bits, but the entire list was written. For one, this was a real pain to write out, something that probably would have been easier to do in Verilog or System Verilog. However, I happen to prefer VHDL for its quirks requiring things to be very explicit, so I'm stuck with writing it out this way. Now, this is a perfectly good implementation in the sense that it works in simulation and will most likely work in reality. However, we should consider the cost to implement this. To do this, I used the Altera Quartus IDE to synthesize this design onto a Cyclone 5E FPGA. This can help us get a sense of the resources required and the operating speeds of this design. To get a speed estimate, I place the leading zero counter component between registers and let the registers go to the device I.O. pins. With that said, let's take a look at what Quartus synthesized. We can start by looking at the RTL view in Quartus. Here is a screenshot of the RTL view and a close-up of how it was synthesized. Notice that it is a very long chain of multiplexers and equal tests, and we have the adder transformation logic at the very end of the chain. While this would work, consider how long the longest signal propagation path is, which is not going to help make sure this component works at a very high clock speed. I actually expected the synthesizer to do a better job than this, implementing it as a lookup table. However, this just goes to show that even in 2018, logic synthesizers can still be quite dumb. Speaking of which, this is how the fitter and the timing analysis performed. This implementation required 103 logic units, some of which are logic units used by the I.O. signals and registers. However, if we only change the implementation and not the top layer setup, then we can effectively factor out those registers. I have included the timing analysis from Cordis using both the slow and fast models, denoted by S and F respectively. These represent the two extremes of possible devices, in worst case and idealistic conditions. An actual implementation is subject to many internal chip conditions and will most likely fall somewhere between the slow and fast models. I should also mention that the synthesizer and the fitter are running with default settings. On the bright side, the slowest estimate is just fast enough for the N64's VR4300 CPU to use. On the downside, the Cyclone 5E has a maximum global clock of 450 MHz, which makes the fast FMAX here seem rather poor. In other words, we can do better. Now let's consider a more complex implementation. This is a tree-based one that I found posted on Stack Exchange. Here the leading zeros are computed in pairs of bits, which build up to form a six-layer tree, which should be of order log n instead of n, where n is the bit width, which in this case is 64. I've also verified this implementation in simulation and it produces the correct results. Now let's see what Quartus came up with. Here you can see the longest signal propagation path is much shorter than the previous case. What about the resource usage? Here this design uses 20 less logic units and should be able to operate between 1.5 to 2 times the clock frequency of the previous implementation. This begs the question though, can we do even better? I found an implementation presented in a paper from 2015 by Milenkovic et al, which used a sort of modified tree structure. I'm not going to show the VHDL code since it's compartmentalized. However, I have verified that it works. Additionally, the RTL viewer in Quartus abstracts the levels away, making it uninteresting to look at. Basically, they do a computation on groups of four bits, which then go into an 8-bit computation for each word, and then go through a mux to select the upper or lower word. The first thing to note here is that this design is probably more efficient for an FPGA since it makes better use of each logic unit, as opposed to only partially using them, so we can expect better resource usage and higher speeds. We can see that it ends up using almost half the logic units of the previous implementation and can operate 20 MHz faster than the tree-based approach on the slowest end and up to 46 MHz faster on the fast end. You can see that we are starting to push up against the 450 MHz limit of the Cyclone 5E. Note that a design can theoretically clock faster than the global clock net, but is still limited to the global clock net speed. This is a non-significant improvement, but could we raise the slow end even further? Here is another implementation from a 2008 paper by Dimitrikopoulos et al. Here they used a semi-tree-based approach, which acts on 16 bits at a time. We can then either expand the 16-bit algorithm to 32 or 64 bits, or we could simply combine the 16-bit blocks using muxes, just like in the previous case. 
I ended up combining them since that was simpler and should provide an equally as fast implementation in an FPGA. Here's how Cordis did on the implementation. We can see that the result requires five more logic units and can run about 10 megahertz faster than the previous implementation. This made me wonder if a hybrid approach would perform better, where instead of trying to transform the result with an adder, we could replace the single counter with four leading zero counters acting at once and select an output based on the result. For this hybrid approach, we can intentionally choose to only perform the leading zero count on subdomains. In this case, we have the LDZI is less than zero domain and the LDZI is greater than zero domain, which correspond to decreasing and increasing the exponent respectively. We can then use a combination of the two fastest methods to detect the number of leading zeros, and we only need to perform a transformation on the upper range, which is significantly smaller than the lower range. So let's use the 16-bit method for that range. To do this effectively, we can shift the input signals to the 32 and 64-bit detectors, as well as the 16-bit detector, to reduce the number of bits to test. For example, the 16-bit method would only need to ever test 10 bits, and the 64-bit method would only ever need to test 52 bits. Instead of modifying the actual detectors, I set the unused bits to a constant 1, and hope that the synthesizer would reduce the redundant logic. Additionally, we would need to have four full detectors here, two for the 32-bit single, and two for the 64-bit double. We can expect this to increase the total resource usage, with the hope that it would increase the operating speed. Unfortunately, this implementation uses quite a bit more logic units, which was expected, but is predicted to operate at a much slower speed. These speed results are comparable to the tree-based method. I also tried another divide-and-conquer approach, which attempted to fully use the six input LUTs of the FPGA, so it acted on six bits instead of four or two. However, the result ended up with worse theoretical performance than this hybrid method. There are also other methods of leading zero detectors, such as the LOD algorithm. However, most of these closely approximate one of the already mentioned cases. There is, however, another type of leading zero counter, which could potentially be faster, and that is the leading zero predictor corrector method. However, such a method would not be applicable to the VR4300 CPU, since the Mantissa and integer data paths are shared. A predictor corrector method would, however, be applicable in a compartmentalized floating point unit, like most modern CPUs have. In such a case, the detector algorithm is broken down into a predictor stage that works in parallel to any arithmetic operation being performed, leaving only the correction part to be done in the second stage. This effectively breaks up the workload into two cycles, where each cycle only has to do half of the work, making it capable of clocking at a higher speed. Let's end with a summary of the different implementations looked at here. If we are not too concerned with resources, then the best solution here is the one which has the highest theoretical clock speed, i.e. implementation 4. It's possible that this implementation is the fastest due to explicit logic used to define the 16-bit chunks, allowing for the synthesizer and fitter to more easily map the logic to a smaller number of logic units. Regardless, this implementation will be more than sufficient for the N64's VR4300 operating speed of 93.75 MHz, and may be capable of allowing a VR4300 implementation to clock at the FPGA's internal clock limit of 450 MHz. I should note that the Cyclone 5E FPGA is not the FPGA that I plan on eventually targeting, but it was the easiest to use for comparison. I may do more videos like this one in the future as I run across deceptively complicated engineering challenges in my 90s era game console emulation project. Thanks for watching.